<laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to Sooner Nation, the online pod, 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 blah, 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 the online podcast. podcast. I can't even talk. We're you're going to speak with British accents today. You're so distracting podcast. right now. Uh, I'm Matt. He's Rich. Special guest today. Uh, is it called a guest podcaster? Is that what we say, or would you say special guest? Because, special guest. But you are a podcaster, are you not? Yes. So can we not say special guest podcaster? You may have to leave is that, it, though. Is it? Oh, sorry, Rich. <laughs> That's okay. It, 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 oh, it, no, it's good oh, coffee. Dude, this, this is, is just a crazy. train wreck at the beginning. Yeah. But if you lean forward, then they don't see Rich on camera. Which wh- helps is, viewership. Exactly. Yeah. It's absolutely I, okay. I actually think, like... If we cut you out, we could do this, no problem. I mean, I, I, they don't tune in to see my face. They tune in to hear my voice is the way I look at it. Um, Craig from The you Thunder Guys. We, we actually have a Thunder Guy, singular, not plural. I feel um, like Zach's going to be disappointed he wasn't invited. I'm uh, just waiting on the message. Zach, we, the invitation is out there soon, my friend. We well, may have to get a bigger space. We gotta, we Let's may, just say a bigger table. We, no, we, we need can, a round table. Then we could be the podcast with like a round table. Yeah. But like we could put Zach right there. Cool. Man, there's like we're losing viewers and listeners right now as we talk about this. Well, your Twitter uh, account's going down. Yeah. Hey, no, the Twitter account actually came up this week. <laughs> uh, the Twitter, and I, I was going to go on a rant about that, um, but I decided not to because the Twitter account actually increased this week. You get a couple of OU softball players to retweet you, and suddenly. Your numbers increase, so I think we've we've found ourselves. Um, Oklahoma City Thunder, there's there's sour cap issues there that we, we want to jump into. Um, obviously, the Oklahoma Sooners are hosting the Arkansas for a Super Regional this weekend. Winner advances to the Women's College World Series. Are we going ahead? Are we just riding in the Sooners in the Women's College World Series? Is that is that? I'm not. You're I'm, not. I, I'm not. I would like like to, but I don't think at this stage of the game you could count anybody as. So how, how, a give me a poem. How many games do you think this weekend goes? Um, it, there's potential for it to go three. They've got yeah, three on top, right? I think it goes two. I do too. I think, in all honesty. So then you're riding in Oklahoma. Are you? Because there's I no way you're going to Like swept. I said, Matt, I'm not. I'm not just going to instantly award someone because I Arkansas am. are I oh, have we, they given wait, 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 listen. No, no, listen they, they won they won three games last weekend, twenty seven to nothing. Here's what you said about Arkansas was they wouldn't get past Wichita State. And here well, they that's are. That's true. Okay, I'll, I'll give you I'm that. just saying I, I don't I don't want to be surprised by a team when something that we're deeming unthinkable happens here during the podcast. To me, I mean the unthinkable is Oklahoma losing. Honestly, mm-hmm. I, I'm, seriously, I mean, well, if we're, we're going to defending gonna, national the, the championships, it would be a heartbreaker but, for them not to. But this has gotten to the stage where it's the unthinkable is actually someone scoring against Oklahoma, is it not? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm serious. I, I mean, they they went against an All American pitcher, Emily Watson. They, they run rolled her. They went through Missouri with the run rule. Oh, yeah, Boston College, the only team. Who's Missouri? Boston College, um, Boston University. There they, you go. They, they, don't, they don't appreciate you calling them Boston knew, College knew they don't. at all. But their coach is pretty cool. Um, but Did that happen in a press conference? Uh, no, they, they in the more, press conference, yeah, they gave a, like a pre-conference to the conference, if you will, where someone got up and, and actually told everyone sitting in the room, it's Boston University. They're commonly referred to as Boston University, so don't use Boston College. Needless to say, I don't know that anyone did. I, I didn't sit in there. There were a couple times when that room got pretty full, and I thought, as a photographer, I'm, I'm just not going to step in because I'm not asking questions anyway. Yeah, it was it was pretty cool, honestly. And the uh, like I said, the coach was cool. Mm-hmm. I, if I were to rank the coaches last weekend um, in 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 the category of coolness. Clearly, Patty is number one, but right. I think well, because she's super cool, man. I mean, there's just there's no one who's ever been around Patty Gasso. Who, I mean, Patty Gasso, and you saw it over the weekend. Patty Gasso can stomp your team into the ground, and as the opponent, you've got nothing but good things to say about her. It doesn't get any cooler than that. But then I think the Boston College coach is right there, number two, with the Tulsa coach right behind her, and then the Missouri coach, man. I, uh-huh. I was I was ready for her to leave. I'm just I'm just gonna throw that out there. I, I was ready for her to go, uh, but 
I called it, did I not, Saturday night? I said, oh, he's going to play Missouri on Sunday. You did, and I also said they would run roll Tulsa, but, oh, yeah, you know, it is, it, it, it I, never, I right. never really thought that was going to happen. Okay, let's jump in here and talk <laughs> about, um, I, we, we were going to talk about the Super Regional. We might talk about it a little bit more, depending on how much time we have at the end, but let, let's talk about <laughs> Oklahoma City Thunder to start off with, because we don't want to waste uh, having Craig here with us. First of all, you guys... Um, you're still active on Twitter, but you've you your Thunder Things podcast is kind of in hibernation mode for the off season. Is that correct? Yeah, we're going to um, whenever Zach finishes up school, we're going to start a uh, I don't know what we're going to call it yet. We need a logo, by the way. So if you're if you're you're now the logo guy, apparently um, we're going to start another podcast where we just talk about all things sports, whatever's going on. We're just going to hang out for an hour and do it. Um, but the Thunder guys won't start up until. To the fall. Yeah, fall starts, comes around. And when, when you, just to clarify, when you say when Zach finished school, he's a teacher. He's a teacher. He's not in school. <laughs> right. Uh, well, he technically is in school. I don't know. But, yeah, you act like I know something about the Thunder. Well, you're a Thunder guy. You've got a Thunder t-shirt on. That doesn't, I mean, that, Which I didn't know we were going to be on camera today. But that's average Joe. For it. That's average Joe Oklahoma City fan right there. They got the Oklahoma City Thunder t-shirt on. They know the name of the starting five. And so they're they're experts. You're, you're right on par. I didn't even wear Thunder shirts for our Thunder Guys podcast. <laughs> See, that's what Zach's going to be upset about, is that you're sporting Thunder here with us on Sooner Nation podcast and not... That's because I let him take the fanboy side of things more than I do. And so he gets I was, that was actually going to be here. one of the questions yeah. I asked you, is who's more level-headed between you and Zach Lowe when it comes to like being able to remove their fandom? Because... And here, here's the thing that I noticed, and, and man, I, Zach's going to be mad. I, we're not trashing him, but one of the things that I just, I, I try to avoid as much as I can when talking about the Sooners, because uh, at this table, I'm probably the biggest Oklahoma Sooners fan. Not that you guys aren't, but like I'm mega fan uh, on that. But I really try to avoid using the phrase we, if, if we get you know, a good quarterback, if we talk right. about the team. And I notice that Zach does that yeah. when he writes. I try not to. But is that, I mean, who who's more, who's more like just gung-ho fan guy and who's more, okay, let's be level-headed here. And, and do y'all balance each other out? Or are you both we do, have your moments? We do balance each other out at times. I would say in general, I'm probably more the realist. He's always optimistic about things. Like when we were down 3-1 in the playoffs, he thought we were coming back. Um, I said we were going to lose in six. Um, but here not you are, initially. Here not you are initially. using the phrase we. Oh, see, you got me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we balance each other out. We both um, go through phases where we're done with it. And we're so negative about the team. And so we kind of help each other out. It's like, you know, it's just ride the wave. The NBA season's full of up and downs. but um, So you're, you are, you're hoping Paul George stays... Zach is banking on Paul George yeah, to stay. Yeah, one hundred percent. He's convinced he's staying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think he is. Uh, I didn't know we we're going to jump into that this early, but um, I feel now that he there was a better chance of him staying than I did as soon as the season ended. Um, he's been hanging out with Russ quite a bit. Yeah, he went to um, his kid's birthday party. Yeah, played paintball. <laughs> no one um, did people. Write yeah, I told you about that? the paintball game, right? Yeah. Was that like some big story? Yeah. Just like him pulling his kid mm-hmm. out of school? Yeah. And you know about the paintball too, right? No, because I know I, I told, heard about this. I know I told you this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Russell Westbrook and Paul George went and played paintball together, mm-hmm. but they lost because Paul George wouldn't shoot. We Sorry. need sound effects. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's jump in. I'm, this is not coming from me. This is coming from ESPN. Um, but then when he talks about the sour cap breakdown for Oklahoma City, here, here they, they've got a couple bullet points. I'm just going to read these, and I, I, I just kind of want some general thoughts from me on this, okay? Um, with or without Paul George, the Thunder are heading toward the luxury tax for the fourth time in five years. If George returns, Oklahoma City will have a payroll of $153 million and a tax bill of $115 million. The Thunder will likely lose Grant to free agency. Bringing back the Ford would cost around $53 million in salary and taxes for one year. If George leaves, the Thunder roster would resemble a lottery team with $117 million committed to the payroll. Bringing back Grant helps, but the signing along with filling the other roster would push Oklahoma City into luxury tax with a projected $130 million in salary and a tax bill of $18 million. 
So it, that was a lot to process. Yeah, well, I'm just saying. I'm just saying what what ESPN saying is in. I mean, one way or the other, Oklahoma City is hosed. I mean, don't you see? I mean, do you agree with that? Yeah, or disagree talk, with that. You and I talked about it a little bit the other day. I told you it was a giant mess. Um, but Jeremy Grant is a perfect example, actually, of Zach and I because he is also convinced Jeremy Grant is returning. But I you guess can't. He released I mean, it. you physically, the numbers don't work. You can't get Paul George and Jeremy Grant. Who do you move? Melo, he's gone. You can't. He's buyout. Okay, let, let's. I'll take it a step further. You can't get Paul George if you have Melo. Okay, well then you're not getting Paul George because I mean, what are you going to buy Melo out? Because even if you buy him out, that's still going to go against your salary cap. And if you're Melo, you are you're owed twenty eight million here. And I've told you this. Here, here's what I would do. I, I think it's it's known that Melo would like to go to Houston, and Houston would like to have him. And what's funny is, is if he goes to Houston, he's coming off the bench. I mean, that's just, there's no way around that. But if that were to take place, if I'm Sam Presti, I'm like, I'm calling Houston. I'm not for sure who yeah. their general manager is. And I'm saying, look, we'll give 15. You guys give, you guys give 13. And you've got Carmelo. There's also um, stretching out his contract. Not a likely option, but that's another option. Right. Um, I definitely think something happens like what you said with you know going partial with another team. Um, you you keep saying Houston, but I think if Houston makes it to the finals, I don't think that they want Melo because I don't think that's a guy that is going to push them over the next you know over that mm-hmm. hill. So I don't see how they're interested. But um, yeah, it's it's a giant dumpster fire right now. But I'm sure Sam Presti. I would hate to be Sam Presti. Well, that's what the next thing I was going to go is, is. Do you feel like the ownership? has looked at Sam Presti and said, hey, you kind of made this mess, so you got you got to clean it up. And, I mean, how much pressure is on Sam Presti right now? A ton. I think he's got – I mean, something's got to happen in this season. Um, Western Conference Finals, maybe even Finals to secure him, you know, a, another contract to, to keep him here without losing his job. Um, deciding to keep Billy Donovan, that's to me is – that that shows how much confidence he has in Billy Donovan because his job is on that, in my opinion. If it doesn't work out, then that falls on Sam Presti. So tons of pressure on him right now. Okay, so stay, staying with the same line of, of conversation, is it possible that the reason Billy Donovan was kept is because this franchise is in such a financial mess right now with salaries and rosters that – Really, you're not going to get another – because you need a high-profile a high profile coach. Yeah. You've got a name out there that you really like. I'll let you mention that if you want to. But you've got to have a high-profile guy. And is there a high-profile guy? I mean, because you can't – you've already got a guy out of college. And it, right now, it right now yeah. it's not working. You can't do that again. So you've got to go out and grab somebody. But these guys are smart enough to look at the tax situation, the salary situation, the roster situation and say, no, thank you. Is, I mean, is it kind of that you had to keep Donovan? Is that is that a legitimate play on it, this? It or is be. it more, well, we have confidence that Donovan can, can do it with this team? It could be, but I still think it's more on, on confidence. Um, giving it, that was, that's a lot of talent all at once for, for a coach to receive it at, you know, no matter what level you're at or how many years you've been doing it. Um, but he simply didn't know how to manage that talent. And I think giving another year, um, another off season to work with all of that. Um, why are you laughing? Carmelo Anthony um, came in fairly late, missed um, part of camp. Paul George um, was out with it for a little bit. Um, they didn't even have a full camp together. So I think having that whole year, if you could get these guys back together, um, it, it would look different in my opinion. Okay, odds are, uh, you know, percentages that Carmelo Anthony's back on this roster next year. Very low. Sub sub forty? Yeah, sub forty. Okay, sub thirty? I was gonna say maybe like thirty percent he stays, seventy percent chance he's gone. Okay. Odds are that Paul George is on the ro- roster next year. Honestly I'd say it's fifty fifty. I don't think he's made up okay. his mind. And then uh, I'm gonna I'm I'm the the question stays with, with Paul George is where 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 is he gonna go? <sighs> Clippers, baby. <laughs> I think he wants to be play for a contender, and I don't know, you know, where. Don't, you don't say go. my Clippers are the contender. I will the punch Clippers you across the table. Are just as much of a contender as the Thunder are. Well, that's not much at all. Um, I was gonna say, you know, with Sam Presti and having to restructure this team, I would love to build around Russell Westbrook 
and, and, and what I mean by that is we don't even necessarily need Paul George. You need someone who can come in and play that play a role position with, without any hesitation, kind of like what Houston has. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many guys are around James Harden and Chris Paul that are just – they're just there to, to do their job and that's it. And the Thunder don't have that. They've got um, – they had three All-Stars last year, um, Stephen Adams as the fourth. And then outside of that, you had Jeremy Grant um, – not a whole lot else going on. As you look at a roster like Houston, they've got nine or ten guys averaging double digit scoring, and so. But that's volume. Don't you think some of that is shot volume? It is, but I think getting Russell Westbrook is not. You're not going to completely change Russell Westbrook's no. game at this point in his career. He's the way that he is, and it can be beneficial if you have guys that fit into his system. Um, so I think it'd be awesome to you know get in some young guys to the draft. However, the Thunder don't have a first-round pick for like the next like six years, so um, that's not an option, unfortunately. Um, but let me ask you this: Is it possible? You you brought up a good point about the draft. Is it possible if if Paul George lets Oklahoma City know he's I'm not staying? Do you do you feel like it's possible? I just spit all over the place uh, that you could work out a sign and trade. And you maybe get a, a first round draft pick, like like Chris Paul with the, with the yeah, Clippers. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, yeah, he seems like I think that's definitely a possibility. Um, I don't think that's that's not what you're trying to aim for, in my opinion. No, I, I know, but at some point you've got to get something, right? right? I mean, you, you I mean, and, and I know probably Oklahoma City fans get tired of hearing this, but it's true, and it doesn't. I mean, for all the home runs that Sam Presti, Presti hit. You lost James Harden for nothing. You lost Kevin Durant for nothing. You've got some point. You've got to get something, right? I yeah. mean, so if you if you realize you're not going to get him, I mean, I, I think you even grovel, please, right. <laughs> please and call him Mister George, please, Mister George. You know, we will sign and trade you. We've got to get something, right? Yeah. Um, it's just. I don't know. Like I said, I, I keep going back to I'm just glad I'm not Sam Presti. I'm glad I don't have to deal with this and be in his shoes because um, definitely the toughest job. In my opinion, out of any roster or any team, um, Sam Presti next season has the biggest summer. He had that last year, mm-hmm. and unfortunately he's got to face that again this summer. And um, Just glad it's not me. Maybe he should buy that house in the Hamptons, that, the Kevin Durant's house, because yeah, it's just, for sale, and make that his summer office You know, and just have people come in there. You know what's crazy? There's actually some people who think that trading Russell Westbrook would be a good idea. I was going to go there. I was saving that for last. So you you did it. Let's jump in there. I think, and you know me, okay, I, I don't consider myself a, a hater. I know you sometimes do, but I am not a fan of the Thunder. But I don't hate the Thunder. But I feel like the, and there's some media guys in Oklahoma City who are really pushing this as well. I feel like it's the dumbest thing ever. Yeah. I mean, you, you might as well, I mean, that's, you, you, if you get rid of Russ, you got to get rid of everybody, in my opinion. You don't keep anybody. You get rid of them all because if you're getting rid of Russ, you're starting over anyway. But I think this is the, the one thing, and we talked about this even on, on past podcasts, the one thing that Russ guarantees you, by the way, there's one person at this table who is in favor of that. Uh, I'm not going to say who it is, but what we talked about is the, the one thing that Russ does guarantee you is tickets. I mean, you're going to – and it's not just Oklahoma City fans. It's when, when the Houston Rockets come, when the Dallas Mavericks come, you know, those fan bases will travel or they will – if they live here like with the military or whatever, they're going to buy tickets because they want to see their team play Russell Westbrook. Right. And if you trade him, you've got nothing. Yeah, if you trade Russell Westbrook, the whole thing might as well fall down and collapse. I mean – Moving back to Seattle. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's basically – it's kind of what the Clippers did to Blake Griffin a little bit. Boy, it is. Sign him for five years and then dump him off. Well, um, yes. Yeah. But I think the difference in that is Blake was involved in that. You know, he didn't like it, but he was involved in it. You know, and I I just don't see how – I don't see how they would do that to Russ. I don't think it's even an option that they would ever consider. What about um, what, what about Steven Adams? Is he a player in this? I mean, do, you, do you look at maybe moving him? To try to free up some space and get something? I don't think so. Um, are, you, are you nodding your head? No. You can oh. answer some of these yeah. questions. He's just like all. sitting over in the corner like yeah. he's been in trouble. 
He just laughs every once in a Nothing's while. Nothing's directed at me, so. Um, well, if you, got qu- if you got questions, jump in here. I know you don't have answers, but if you got questions. <laughs> Sorry, Stephen um, Adams. I think when you look at Stephen Adams, who has made huge steps forward each year that he's played, um, dealing with injuries, he is still. Um, develops more and more each year. I don't think he's a guy that you, right now, you want. He's someone that I was talking about. He's still a young guy. What is he, 23, 24 years old, um, that can build along with Russ. Um, I, I said it all season long, and I hope that next season, Billy Donovan listens to me, um, make Steven Adams the center of the offense. Mm-hmm. The ball's obviously going to be in Russell Westbrook's hand, but run away from the ball screens, on the ball screens. Steven Adams should be the center because that opens up, creates opportunities for other things to happen on the court. Um, the reason that's not happening is because when the Thunder hired Billy Donovan, they hired, um, uh, man, Scott Brooks 2.0, basically. I mean, it's the same offense. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, the Thunder have never had a moving offense. Um, I keep going back to Houston, but if you look at Houston, they've got there's guys moving always. Even Golden State, um, the two best offenses in the league, um, you guys are really distracting me. He's moving a lot. Oh. He's, he's, he's um, not he, moving he, a lot. I'm just moving things. They've got guys moving with Sorry, the ball, like also write. without the ball. It's constant in motion. Um, the Thunder with Scott Brooks, with Billy Donovan, has mm-hmm. always been a standstill. It, and you think that's coaching? That's not that's not personnel. That's coaching. It's coaching. I, I mean, I, I get it. They're professional athletes. They're going to do what they want. But there's coaches out there who make these guys do what they need to do, what they want them to do. And so... The excuse of, well, he can't control these guys on the court is not a good one in my opinion. Um, I think a better offense needs to be put in place. And that's what I thought would happen with Billy Donovan coming from from Florida uh, in college. A lot of college basketball, it's, mm-hmm. it's not standstill like it is in the NBA one-on-one. So, but he got here and that simply didn't happen. Okay, so Paul George, Carmelo Anthony, those are the top two priorities for Oklahoma City in the offseason. After those, who, who becomes the next priority? Raymond Felton, Jeremy Grant, Josh Hustis, or Corey Brewer? Um, a lot of people are going to say Jeremy Grant. I'm not the biggest on Jeremy Grant. Um, His dad played for Oklahoma, though. Did he? Yeah. No. All right, sorry. Keep going. Well, um, <laughs> I, I You're think, young, man. You don't remember Harvey Grant. Um, I, I would go with um, Raymond Felton, as if you're going to sign one of those mm-hmm. guys who are a free agent. Um let me see. I believe. Cut you off guard, my bad, homie. No, I'm just looking at this. Um, I think getting Raymond Felton saves you money because they both. Um, Jeremy Grant, in my opinion, is going to want big time money, not like big, big time, but he's going to want more than the Thunder have to offer him. According to ESPN, it's fifty three million. For what five? Three? It just said it just said fifty. It's going to add fifty three million if you if you sign Grant. It's probably, I mean, close. Well, yeah. for one year, it says around fifty-three million for salary and taxes for one year. I thought he was going to want twelve to fifteen. Um, right. Zach Zach Lowe thinks he's going to want eight to ten. Um, I, I I don't see the Thunder being able to afford him as opposed to Raymond Felton. You got him for the veteran minimum right. this year. I think that's a possibility again. Um, Which is what I mean. The, the comeback full circle. That's what Carmela should be on right now. It's the veteran minimum, but he's not. It'd be cool, like if so, he did, like a David West when he went to. Uh, um, Golden State. Just is, it, the, is it with Melo? San Antonio. Is it you know, David West went to Golden State? Yeah, yeah. from San Antonio. Yeah. It, is it? Is it with Melo? Is it the twenty eight million more than? And like, if if he's on the veterans minimum, oh are, yeah, you're you're excited to have him stay for another yeah. year. But it's the twenty eight million. Happening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, I, I still think that I, I don't think he would be worth the twenty eight million. I'm still thinking that Carmelo Anthony in a second season would have a lot better than he perform a lot better than he did this last year. Um, he was constantly changing roles. I think getting him in his natural position as opposed to making him that stretch four would help out. But um, that's another thing. Was he's already bad enough as it is at defense, but then he's having to guard power forwards. You know what I mean? It's just uh, it didn't work. Uh, I will say, good news, this is the last year of Kyle Singler's contract. <laughs> so that's one more year of an eyesore, and then that's that's over with. All right, so you're saying Raymond Felton, outside of Paul George and, and Carmel, Raymond Felton's the next priority. Okay, last question for you, and then we're going to move on talking some Big 12 stuff, uh, football. But last question is, um, what is, in your mind, what is a reasonable number? If you're, if you're going to buy out Carmelo, 
Cool. And he's oh just it's just under it's like twenty seven point nine five two yeah. million. What's a reasonable number to offer him to buy him out? What would you what would you would you hit it in the middle? See I let's see. Yeah, twenty just on oh yeah, almost twenty eight thousand or twenty eight million. Um yeah, I, I think what you said in, in the middle of 14, 15, like what you mentioned with Houston offering offering that much and seeing if someone will take it. I still, if if you're another team, are you wanting to pay Carmelo Anthony fifteen million dollars this year though? You know, I just think it's a tough. Well, that's why I say Oklahoma City stuck with it. Yeah, because Melo owns. I mean, he holds all the cards. Uh, so you have to agree with a buyout number, and that's going to have to be a high buyout number because no one else is taking him. So. Sam Presley, Sam Presley can't come out and say, look, we owe you $28 million. We're going to give you eight cash up front and send you on your way. I'm sorry. You owe me $28. I'm not selling for eight because you got no other op- – right. there's no leverage for Oklahoma City here. So um, Yeah, I, I think shooting in the middle would be your best bet. I also think if the Thunder end up stuck with him, don't – don't play into his what he right. wants with with giving him that starting job. You know, if it's best for the team, stick him on the bench. I mean, he'll be the highest paid bench player in the league. Well, every time that every, being said, if you got to pay him, you might as well do what's right. best instead of. Well, every time he complains about riding the pine, you say, "Here's that buyout." Right. You know. Yeah. So. I, I, yeah. Okay, he's uh, Craig Thunder guys. Uh, hit up. Well, what's your Twitter uh, handle and all that stuff? You know, crossover Radio. Tell them how um, they can find you guys. The, at the Thunder Guys on Twitter and Instagram, um, Crossover Radio. Um, I don't know if they're on Twitter. They are on Facebook, though, just the Crossover Radio I'm app. I'm sure they're on Twitter. Well. Um, and then, yeah, you can download the app in the App Store, both on Android and Apple products. We will I will have information coming. I don't know when we're starting this thing, but it will <laughs> be in the next few weeks. We'll, we'll, right. we'll be doing our sports podcast. Um, right. We'll let you know. Uh, Center Nation podcast, online podcast of heartland-sports.com. You can find us on Twitter at Sports Heartland. Big 12 football, it's the off season. There's all kinds of summer things going out. Athlon yesterday picked Oklahoma to finish as the highest ranked Big 12 team in 2018. But they have the Sooners at number 10 in the country. Um, and you're, did you read the article? Did you see that, Rich? Yeah, yeah, that one is right there on the screen. Uh, I I glanced at it. I I didn't give it a full read through. So Athlon picked. No, that's fine. I I don't read your stuff either. Uh, Athlon picked four teams to finish in the top twenty-five in the Big Twelve. We know Oklahoma's one of them because we just Mm. said they picked them to finish uh, number ten. So let's play a little game here. Uh, Who do you think they finished second in the Big Twelve as the highest ranked team? That's easy. So it's Virginia. Who do you think, Chris? Since you pick West Virginia, I'll pick Oklahoma State. I'm going to give a big fat negative to both of you DCM? guys. Uh, strike two. Texas. Texas. Oh, I should have <laughs> so, seen that coming. So what does that do towards the credibility of this list that you've got the Texas Longhorns that's, as the second highest ranked team in the Big 12? The By the way, Oklahoma that's, that's State doesn't make thing. the list. That's a perennial thing. It's a perennial thing for preseason, but this is like how they're going to finish I the know. season. I know. It's just a random prediction. They're, they're banking a lot on young talent from Texas. You told me I'm not allowed to talk about quarterbacks, but quarterback play is going to no, decide. No, there's just one specific part decide, of the know, show. You're not allowed I'm to talk about quarterbacks. Time. It's going to decide where Texas actually finishes, not only in the conference, but if they're even ranked in the in the nation. Mm-hmm. No, I, I agree. I, I, I mean, recruiting's there for them, yeah? So, well, I, there's, there's a struggle going on in the state of Texas right now with Texas recruits. Um, and there's actually... And this is something that kind of keep under the radar, but but keep an eye on it this year. Because last year there was players, there was players, that's my my good English, uh, there were players whose parents were very vocal towards Tom Herman uh, on Twitter post-game for just about every game. And, um, And now you're starting to see some of the fan base begin to rumble like, well, wait a minute, why is that kid committed to Texas A&M? Why is that kid committed to Oklahoma or Oklahoma State? Why is Texas not getting that kid? Now, that's not to say Texas isn't getting players, but Tom Herman, as of right now, is not at that level that Mac Brown was at, where Mac Brown just basically said, "Okay, you're." I, I was going to do this in my Mac Brown voice, but I decided not to. But Mac Brown basically, said, "Okay, you're, you're a junior." 
So you got to commit now because by the time you're a senior, all the spots are filled up. So I just pulled up a list of who's already enrolled, who's signed with Texas, and they have they have two five star recruits inside of the top twenty five ranked in the nation that are incoming freshmen. No, but, but look enrolled. at look at twenty nineteen. You're looking at last year's class. So you need to look at the the next year's class. No, no, no. I was saying they're banking on. Oh, I feel you on young talent this year. Well, and, we've and that's talk- where I feel like Athlon's coming from. Well, and we've talked about that. We Just last week on the show, we talked about quarterback position. I mean, if it's Ellinger again, there's no way. I, I, there's no way they'll be the second. I'm not saying they won't finish in top 25, but they won't be the second-ranked Big 12 team. Ba- basically, what this is saying is that it's going to be Oklahoma and Texas in the Big 12 championship game. Mm-hmm. If you think about it, the way they finish. Oh, that'd be cool. It would be I fun. Forgot. That's a possibility. It would be fun, but... I, I, I see no way that's a possibility. Texas also has like a top ten Vegas odds to to make the college football play. Hey man, Las Vegas Golden Knights. If if you were Marty McFly and you had the DeLorean, hey, that's where you make your bet. Someone said with the, the recent law change on sports betting that they should they would open up a, a sports book in Austin, Texas, and make bank because everybody would just be picking Texas for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just make cash in on all that money. Okay, so let's let's go back to the game. Texas is number two on this. Oklahoma number ten. Uh, the the final ranking for Texas, Athlon predicts, is number twenty. The next Big Twelve team uh, jumps in here at number twenty two, which is who? West Virginia. West Virginia. Yeah. And then finally, number twenty four would be. I'll let you go first. Oklahoma State. I'm TCU. Going, I'm going TCU. 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 Mm-hmm. TCU. Oklahoma State doesn't make the list. But again, I'm I'm putting TCU and West Virginia both ahead of Texas. That's just me. I mean, that's that's the way I, I look at it. Um, okay, so we're gonna jump in here because um, we we gotta we want to jump in and, and be involved in the pre, the preseason Big Twelve talk. Um, and I want to go through the Big Twelve teams, and I want to talk about um, I want to talk about the biggest question mark that each team has as they hit the summer. Um, and and the thing is that. The one thing you can't say is you can't say quarterback because the majority of the Big 12, that's their question mark, is quarterback. We've already talked about Texas. We know the Oklahoma situation, Oklahoma State, uh, Texas Tech. All the way down, pretty much everybody but West Virginia, um, they're looking at a quarterback situation. So we're going to say here is the biggest question mark for this team that's not the quarterback. And the way we're going to do this is I have taken Athlon's formula – I have made my own list of how I believe the Big 12 will finish in 2018. So we're going to start at the bottom and work our way to the top. Okay. Now, before we do this, it comes Kansas, just move right. yeah, exactly. Before we do this, uh, Craig, who is invested heavily in basketball, has not had time to really delve into football as much. So he's got his own set of lists that he's going to go with. Uh, you got two top five lists, right? I do. And so. Um, you're going to do the top five coaches in the Big 12, mm-hmm. and then you're going to do your top five disappointments as a fan. Yes. Uh, of a fan of the Oklahoma yes. Sooners, or is it a fan general? Fan of the Sooners, like oh. being at the game. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So um, why don't you – let's go with coaches first. Is that all right? Coaches, you guys can talk for a little bit, and then I can – oh, we're just doing it all now. Yeah, and yeah. Well, yeah, we're going to – we're going to – here's what we'll do. We'll do – no, let's do – here, we'll do a – yeah. I'm, I'm confusing myself. Let's do coaches, and then we'll do 10 through 16. here for a while. Yeah, because, I mean, yeah, I don't want you to pull a Richard and just sit there and be quiet for 30 minutes. Well, maybe there. direct a question my way. Even look in my general direction. What else? I forgot you were even here, dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, Craig, top, <laughs> top five I'm coaches. I'm going to it up and check you guys out. <laughs> top five coaches in the Big 12. Um, at number five, I've got Matt Campbell. Yeah, I like, I like Iowa I like State. Him. Yeah, I, I put him there because it's more of I was looking at the remaining coaches and I was like, I think I like him the best because they're all five through ten are kind of all just in there together. Um, number four, I've got Bill Snyder. Okay, time out. Oh, wait, I want I want to clarify what you just said. So you feel like five through tens all just blah, 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 blah. yeah. I feel like you've got three okay. or four elite coaches in the Big Twelve, and then after that, it's kind of okay. Um, I- Bill Snyder at number four. He's a wizard. Um, number three, Gary Patterson. And that was tough because at number two, I've got Mike Gundy. And those two were the hardest, in my opinion, to... Patterson to, and Gundy? Yeah, to decide okay. who was two and three. And then number one, he's the youngest coach, Lincoln Riley. Um, this isn't a homer decision, I feel like. Uh, Are you sure? I'm sure Lincoln Riley in one year accomplished 
I mean, look at what he but did. But he inherited a bunch of talent. He did. But, That's all I'm saying. But then you've also got to look at the recruiting that he's done, and then you know what I mean for future mm-hmm. classes. So um, I will say there's been there's been a, a, an incredible boom on recruiting in the last. 18 months. And they, they've they changed a lot of what they're doing, obviously. We saw that manifest itself in the spring game. Um, the changes that they made, all three of us were there. We witnessed it firsthand to attempt to draw or to impress not only the fans, but recruits who would be attending. So I agree with that whole thing. I hadn't been to a spring game in a couple of years, but that's the biggest attendance that I've seen. Was it, was, was it the yeah, largest? I think it, I think it was, yeah, it was uh, miserable. I'm just saying it was a miserable day. And what it was a cold? terrible. Cl- I was freezing, dude. Mm, what else is new? Yeah, but I was so cold. I had. I was your all. Your body wasn't up. adjusted yet. To- <laughs> I, I was so. I went down and bought like a five dollar cup of hot chocolate, and my bones were still cold. Um, Richard, you. All right, so I'm gonna see if you got anything different. He he's got um, Matt Campbell, which is a rising star, mm-hmm. uh, and then Bill Snyder, and then Gary Patterson, Mike Gundy, and Lincoln Riley. What would you do different, or would you keep that list the same? I, I like the top five. Um, I wouldn't disagree with the names that are there. I'm, I may slightly rearrange them and, and put Bill Snyder one slot up, just because of what he consistently does with less talent. They heavily rely on junior college transfers mm-hmm, mm-hmm. coming in to fill these major roles, and, and they've had a lot of success. You think back to Colin Klein being obviously the biggest name that we've had recently from Kansas State as a potential Heisman candidate. I mean, who thinks of these things when you think specifically of a Kansas State? Who thought of Kansas State coming in to what I saw Toby Rowland today, um, and I thought of this was the the Palace on the Prairie? Who comes in and just hands Oklahoma a loss? That doesn't it doesn't happen very frequently. I mean, Mike Gundy's not doing right. doing that very yeah. often. So you, I, I I like the top five, but I, I may just bump him up, Bill Snyder up one. Yeah, and here's my question on Bill Snyder: um, is is it is it fading the the allure of Bill Snyder? Is that starting to fade? It is. And it, yeah. I mean, I, at what point? I mean, the guy's got. I, I mean, I, this sounds so harsh. I don't mean it to sound harsh, but what does he else he's got going for him other than football? And at what point do you say, look, man, we love you. There's already a statue of you outside the stadium. Can we make you like – named after you. I mean, can we make you head football coach emeritus, but you're just a figurehead now. So you're – if you had a dream or a path for him to follow, would it be um, (laughs) – who's the guy at OU who used to coach with – Barry Switzer? No, who used to coach with him. (laughs) Merv Johnson. Yes. A similar path – for Bill Snyder to Merv Johnson? Yeah, the difference is coaching may be what's keeping Bill Snyder like going. Well, that's not what I, I mean. That's why I, 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 I know I get it like, because I didn't want to say that, but you did. Yeah, but I, but I, I said I, I don't want to be it, mean. That's what I, I mean. Like, the guy's like 150. So. <laughs> he was there when football was invented. <laughs> so, I mean, but I, I, well, here's the thing, and, and I because I, I agree with everything you guys said. What Bill Snyder has done for the Kansas State program, there is not another coach in America who's done a program in that way. I mean, we, we talk about how what amazing it was that Bob Stoops turned around Oklahoma from what it was after Gary Gibbs and then John Blake. Like Gary Gibbs kind of grounded it. John Blake crashed it. And then Bob Stoops built it back up. But even at that point, you had a championship tradition that you could fall back on. You just needed some momentum. There was no tradition at all in Manhattan, Kansas. And he built this program from scratch, walked away from it. Ron Prince comes back in and does like the, the Gary Gibbs, puts it back on the ground, and then he comes back to restore it. So that's all there. Dude's Hall of Fame, and he should be in every Hall of Fame there is. But at some point, that begins to fade, and people are like, come on, man, retire already. And to me, that's sad. That's tragic. And I'm wondering, is are we there? I, I, have we arrived to that point with Bill Snyder? I think as long as they're still a threat, then no. Because I don't know about you, but I get nervous every year we play Kansas State. Like, yeah, that could be the – what year was it? Um, it was – was it Sterling Shepard's freshman year mm-hmm. when he when he hurled that? Yeah, guy? that was I mean, enormous. They, they came yeah. in and spoiled the whole season. Uh-huh. Um, so I think as long as that's still a threat, as long as they're still 
getting eight, nine wins, then it's one of those things, who are you going to bring in that can do better? Right. Okay. I feel you. I feel you. Okay. So, Richard, let's start at the bottom. Kansas Jayhawks, biggest question mark. Uh, you want to go first? You want me to go first? Either way. Um, I'll, I'll take the first one. I, I feel like the biggest question mark for the Kansas Jayhawks is really – you, I wasn't giving you any because you were like throwing some th- options at me before we started. Oh, because I, I just had a question mark. Written. I, I think I yeah, because that. I think the biggest question mark for Kansas is the future of this program. Uh, this this year will commemorate the tenth year, the tenth anniversary of Kansas going and just not even not just going but winning the Orange Bowl over Virginia Tech. And look what's happened the last decade. Now you find out yesterday they fired their athletic director. By the way, our friend Kenny Mossman yeah, is a one of the candidates to replace uh, to, to become the next athletic director at the University of Kansas. But what does that do for David Beatty? I mean, the, the guy, I, I don't know how he still has a job. And by all accounts, he's a good guy. But I also feel like by all accounts, he lost his football team last year. The fact that. He, he came out and said, no, I had no idea they weren't going to shake Baker's hand. Either he's a liar, and he that was premeditated, or he's lost control of his football team, and he's got captains out there doing things that they shouldn't be doing. I, you know, what is the future of this program, and does David Beatty go into this 2018 football season as a lame duck coach because it's not going to be a winning season in Kansas if the new athletic director comes in there, be it Kenny Mossman or whoever else, the first thing they're going to have to address is this football program. And you you can throw out there, hey, David, we, we need to see a bowl game this year uh, before we can talk contracts. Well, you're not going to see a bowl game for Kansas. Yeah. I mean, you might see three wins, but you're not going to see a bowl game. So to me, the biggest – Which the, they would take that at this point, I think. Three wins? Yeah. <laughs> to me, the biggest question mark for the Kansas Jayhawks is clearly the future of this program – you, football has to be more than just passing the time very, very slowly until basketball starts. Rich? I can't disagree with you there, but my my take on it is there is talent on this Kansas roster, and I think they're hanging on to a guy like David Beatty because of who people have said he is in the recruiting realm. David Beatty is highly touted as one of the best recruiters anywhere in the country, but we haven't seen that at Kansas. The highest class he's brought in has been ranked number 70. Unfortunate for Kansas because that just doesn't work in the Big 12. But, again, I think that's why they're hanging on to him. So they do have talent. um, But the the biggest question for me that I'm looking at with Kansas is depth. They struggle Mm -hmm. when they have to rely on a rotation of players to keep up with the talent of the top-tier teams here in the Big 12. Right. Okay. Sounds good. All right, so let's move on. To me, my number nine team uh, for 2018 is Baylor. Um, and I'm going to let you go first on who you feel. First of all, if you guys disagree with the, the order of finish, holler. That's fine. We, we, that could be a whole other discussion. But I've got Kansas finishing last, Baylor finishing last. I've got seven I've got seven of the ten being bowl eligible, three teams not being bowl eligible. Um, and that will be pretty evident here in just a minute. But what, what do you got biggest question mark for Baylor? With Baylor, obviously, it's culture. Um, that's not my final answer, but I think that's what they're working on. That's why now Rule is in there, and he's attempting to change the culture and the the way Baylor is perceived as not only a university, but a program. I was thinking we're looking at on the field issues, and so I was going to say that their biggest concern heading into the season, aside from culture, is the offensive line. Um, they had yeah. two quarterbacks who were hurt last season in a league that likes to pass first, run second, when you have to dip down to your third string. And granted, they they did some surprising things when they had to dip into uh, that stable of quarterbacks that they had, if you're willing to call them that at this point in time. But if they can produce an offensive line that's actually capable of protecting the quarterback, I think they can improve upon last season. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, I've got really... One one big one all together, but then there's a sub one. And that to me, it's um, – I think they are set at quarterback. And I, and I know we're not allowed to talk about quarterbacks, but I, I think when you got it's guys – No, I'm, this isn't a question mark. I'm saying you got I, – I said West Virginia is the only school that, that doesn't have a quarterback issue. I don't think Baylor does. I think – I just – I think they're set at, at quarterback. Robert and Griffin. 
Yeah, we're hoping for the thirds coming back. Um, but <laughs> who's a running back? I mean, and, and that's one area where they, they really kind of struggled last year was making headway in the Big 12, which is, which by the way, the Big 12 is going to transition this year from a league of quarterbacks to a league of running backs. And you've got Ooh. you've got Jamichael Hasty, you've got Terrence Williams there. I don't I don't know who else you've got. And what you said about the offensive line, to to make that transition, you've got to be good up front. And my question is, can Baylor run the football? Because they're going to have to. They're I think they're going their biggest leap this year is going to be on the defensive side of the ball. They weren't terrible defensively last year. I think they improved defensively, but their numbers just aren't there yet. And in fact, I don't even know if they have a tight end on their roster. I was trying to go through position breakdowns for Baylor. I couldn't even find a tight end. So if anybody knows who the Baylor tight end is, hit me up because that's key to your running game because you need a blocking tight end who can also slide out uh, in a soft spot of the zone uh, for play action. And I don't think Baylor has that. So... For me, their biggest the biggest question mark there is that the running game and going along with what you're saying about the offensive line is adding a, a blocking tight end uh, to that to that position. Um, so number number eight um, for me in the Big 12, I've got the Texas Tech Red Raiders. I'm going to go ahead and make my bold uh, bold prediction that this is the last year that we see Cliff Kingsbury as the head coach of Texas Tech. They've wanted to fire him the last two years. They couldn't afford it. Uh, last year, they actually had a little bit better of a year than what they expected. But there is no quarterback on campus for Texas Tech. We can't talk about quarterbacks. But I'm just throwing that out there. But for me, do you, do you guys realize that, that Texas Tech and their spring game, their offense was outscored by their defense – in the spring game, when's the last time that has happened in Lubbock, Texas? I think offense. I, that. <laughs> I think offense is going to be a train wreck uh, in Lubbock this year, and and there's already I mean, there there is a growing sentiment of resentment for Cliff Kingsbury, and he went from being the golden child to the uh, to the golden scapegoat now. Um, and recruiting has, if you follow recruiting, look at the recruiting of Texas Tech. And, and, you know, it goes back. Go, look at Kevin Sumlin at Texas A&M. You get all these guys in there, and if you don't treat them right, they're gone. I mean, think about the, the not just Baker Mayfield, but all the other quarterbacks in that class who left, and then you just put all your money in the Patrick Mahomes basket. Well, Patrick Mahomes obviously left as well, and the, the cupboard was bare because people, they know. That tells the real story of what happened with these football players. There's always the coach's version and there's the player's version, but the real story comes out in what happens with recruits. If the coach was in the right and the players were in the wrong, get, then players keep going there. But if the coach was in the wrong and the players were in the right, then guess what happens? Players stop. You were on recruiting trips. What what happened if you were in a recruiting trip and one of the players comes up to you and says, look, dude, here's what happened, man. You're not going to go there with that coach. You saw it happen at Texas A&M. That's why Kyler Murray is at Oklahoma. Baker Mayfield came to Oklahoma. Kevin sumlin has gone, and I think Cliff Kingsbury is going to be gone this year because that whole offense is a giant question mark. Back to you, sir. I, I am going to agree with you. I had just – Put a little side note and said skill position players mm. were going to be the biggest question mark because if I correct me if I'm wrong here, but they're losing their top wide receiver, they're losing their their running back as well. It's it's who's going to replace those, who's going to step up, right. and since we're not allowed to talk about the quarterback. <laughs> We're throwing that one in the mix as well, regardless. Yeah, we're not allowed to talk about the quarterback, but I brought it up twice. Yeah, I know, right? I, I just don't know what the offense is going to look like. Um, I know what a traditional Texas Tech offense looks like, and I don't know how they will resemble anything close to that this upcoming season. Maybe that's a good thing. It could be. It could be. I really worked before, so. No, well, I mean, you've got to build defense. I mean, a program like... This is going to sound bad, but Oklahoma has proven you can get enough top-notch talent that you can make it all the way to the playoffs without defense. Look at last year. Texas Tech cannot get that much talent to make it happen. They, they've got to focus on defense. And, again, we're going back to all the miscues. That, but he had, like, three defensive coordinators in three years because he kept firing the guy. Well, you got to give a guy time. Anyway, Texas Tech, I, that's going to be a fun train wreck to watch. 
And I would not be surprised. I went ahead and picked Baylor to finish ninth. I would not be surprised if it's Texas Tech. The reason why I gave Texas Tech the nod uh, is because they both have super soft schedules. And uh, I think Texas Tech would maybe one game better. Or maybe they're tied with a terrible record, but Texas Tech somehow beats Baylor uh, in the regular season. All right, uh, number um, – Number seven, and the first team I, I find to be bowl eligible for the Big 12 this year is, is Craig's boy, Matt Campbell, and the Iowa State Cyclones. Uh, Richard, your biggest question mark for Iowa State is what? Uh, again, we're looking at the offensive line here. They have one of the better running backs, if not in the Big 12, in the country. I think they have Montgomery. maybe the best running back in the Big 12. And we saw how productive he was, but the offensive line did him zero favors. Mm-hmm. Um, someone actually went and tabulated how many missed missed blocks there were and the work that David Montgomery actually had to do to get the yardage that he produced for that team. If they improve there, David Montgomery is going to be a star. I mean, yeah. he could be the talk of the town and and everyone over here at this table is talking about Rodney Anderson currently. So, well, Rodney we'll Anderson, not Justice Hill, Rodney Anderson. I'd, let's go ahead and throw David Montgomery. I'll do respect to Justice Hill. I think he's phenomenal, but look at what Rodney Anderson did. The last half of the season, there's not a better running back in the Big 12. Yeah. But look what David Montgomery. There wasn't a better offensive line either. That's true. And that's what I'm saying. Look what David Montgomery did with that mm-hmm. offensive line. And it's equally impressive, if not more so. To me, you mentioned offensive line. I've got to go with the receivers. Um, I, I, I like, I'm a big fan of David Montgomery. Um, and I was a big fan of Alan Lazard, even though he beat Oklahoma in Norman last fall. But, but Iowa State lost Alan Lazard. Now who's going to step up and be that next? I mean, Alan Lazard, he wasn't just a possession receiver. And I mean, he was a guy that was going to come down with the ball, but he was also a downfield threat. And that's what makes guys special. When they can, when they can come down with the ball every time, but they can also be a downfield threat. You were a quarterback. You had your position, possession receivers, those guys that you knew could go intermediate and you get the ball in their area, they're going to catch it. But you also love, because I know you had one, a guy who could get downfield and had that same quality. You put the ball in his area downfield and he's going to catch it. That's what Alan Lazard was, and that's what made this Iowa State offense click. Be, their quarterback's not a superstar. He's better. He, he's a good quarterback. But that receiver, Alan Lazard, was a superstar. They've lost him. Who's going to replace him? Thoughts? Anything? You're, you're just – I'm pointing at you and, and you're being quiet, but that's okay. Uh, it's almost your time to talk again. All right, number six for me, and then we'll take a break. Here's here Craig's second top five of the day. Uh, for me, it's the Kansas State Wildcats. Number six, I've, I've got Kansas State becoming bowl eligible again this year. And what could be, could be the Bill Snyder farewell tour. Who knows? Um, defense becomes an issue here for me when I look at Kansas State um, because we can't talk about the other position of interest here. Um, but I, I worry about the Wildcats whenever you're re, um, developing junior college talent, it's even more so hit or miss than, than um, what am I trying to say? It's even more so hit or miss than developing younger guys out of high school because those younger guys out of high school, you get um, you actually get time with them to, to develop them. But you need, you need a junior college guy really to produce immediately if you're a program like Kansas State. Their top tackler from last year is gone. Uh, Jay Kirby, um, linebacker, he, he 99 tackles is what he produced last year, and he's gone. Who's gonna Who's gonna fill the gap in Kansas State's defense? I don't know. There There could be somebody there. By the way, their second top tackler from last year, 97 tackles. Trent taking is gone. They They lost a lot on this defense with through through uh, attrition for seniors. I don't know that they're going to have the defense to be competitive in the Big 12 this year. They, they could. I just don't know about it. That's why it's a question mark to me. I didn't write the whole defense. You wrote linebacker? Mark. No, I just wrote pass defense. Okay. Um, they were second worst in the country last year. I keep pointing to the Big 12 being this offensive powerhouse when it comes specifically to the passing game and producing quality quarterbacks, quality receivers. Quality tight ends. We've seen that for years. Kansas State's going to bring this subpar secondary to the table. I, I don't know that I would have them ranked as high, as high as you do at this point in time, simply because of that fact. 
Well, a soft schedule is going to get you some some points there. Um, okay, Craig, top five most disappointing moments as a fan as we take intermission here on our Big 12 question marks. Let's do it. Um, at number five, we've got OU versus TCU in 2005. Yeah. Um, I was a wee little lad. You should have been banned from games. I know. Rhett Bomar. <laughs> I think what made it so bad was that was during the time where OU didn't lose at home. Mm-hmm. Was, you know what I mean? That was, um, it was like, a guarantee almost that, that OU was going to win if they it were playing wasn't, Norman. Wasn't LaDainian Tomlinson on that no, team? No, 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 no. How, how no, old is he? No. He's all way older than that. LaDainian Tomlinson never played in the Big 12. Well, that was before, that was before, that was before they were yeah. in the Big 12 as well. But uh, but no, he, you can Google him up, but he was gone before then. Um, and then at number four, I've got OU versus Texas A&M at the Cotton Bowl in 2013. Okay, that's what I thought you would have number one. Oh, really? Honestly. Yeah, when I kept um, saying I knew what your number one would be, I thought that would be it. The thing is, is I was kind of a Johnny Menzel fan. And so it, it, it sucked because that doesn't mean I was cheering for him, but I enjoyed and I, I, I mean, it was an excellent performance mm. that he, he put on. And um, I still had fun. I got out of school for the day and we got to take the trip. So we sat at the very top. Of Jerry's mm-hmm. world like there were, you could not get higher than I don't what we were. I've ever sat higher at a stadium or venue in my entire life. Like I have. Was, I, I was at the Sugar Bowl when OU lost to LSU, uh, um, and that we were. Yeah. That was the, it, it was a 2003 season, but 2004 Sugar Bowl, and we were same same distance there in the Superdome. And just what's crazy about those tickets is that they're all priced the same way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not, not resale value, but I mean. Right. We paid the same for what people were, you know what I mean? I think so, we got them for free, though. I'm kidding. I mean, I, yeah. mean, I, mean, I don't know. Probably. Uh, anyways, <laughs> at, know. Arms at, cool at number three, I've got um, OU versus Oklahoma State, 2014. Um, Tyreek Hill? Yes. Overtime loss. Um, shouldn't have punted. And what made that one so brutal Should have punted the second time. Right. Um, what made that one so brutal was I took my friend Johnny to the game who was an Oklahoma was, State fan. Right. And I had literally just finished saying, hey, sorry that your pokes lost, but thanks for coming. Um, I Like, OU fans were pulling out the keys to mock Oklahoma State because that's kind of their thing, and uh, then it was all downhill after that. Um, number two, I've got OU versus Notre Dame, 2012. Uh, that was a fun night, except for was, the football game. It was. Everything. Well, first quarter was... Yeah. I still say, to this day, I still say Tony Jefferson got robbed in that game. Yeah. Clearly a fumble, in my opinion. Clearly a fumble. Clearly knocked him out. <laughs> um, I sat in the student section, so it was a cool environment, um, but it quickly faded. And it was kind of one of those games where you just kept waiting for you to do something. Like that meme where they're like, this guy, dude's got the stick, and he's like, come on, do something. Like, <laughs> uh, it just never happened. And then number one, um, I've got OU versus Ohio State, 2016, in Norman. I sat by myself. I paid a lot of money, and it was miserable. Uh, the worst part was hearing Ohio State do their cheer throughout the stadium, like they, they spill uh-huh. up, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, and they at that point they outnumbered OU fans. So, uh-huh. uh, and then honorable mention. Oh, there's an honorable mention. There is, there's an honorable ben- mention. Um, OU versus Texas, 2013. Because that was my first time and only time seeing OU lose to Texas live, and it was coming off of two blowout wins in the previous two seasons. Um, and OU wasn't competitive in that game either. So Yeah, I remember the first time, uh, by the way, if, if no one's put connect the dots, Craig is my son. Uh, I remember the first time I took you to the OU Texas game, it was blowout win, 65-13, something like that. Mm-hmm. I remember telling you, man, this is special because it doesn't happen like this every year. And then the next the year, next year, the next year yeah. we're going back, and you're talking about the blowout. I was like, remember, that, that, that doesn't happen every year. And then that led up to another blowout, and then finally your first loss. Richard, what's your what's your top loss as a fan? Top uh, loss. Yeah, like, I, do I, I put a top loss? A, a game, really a I mean, the the game that just hurts the most that you were there, and it just hurts the most. I didn't have to be there. Um, I, I watched it on TV instead, but it was no. It's got to be a game experience. That you were I there. Wanna, I don't want to be a game. Experience. <laughs> yeah, it has to be a game. It it's be, the yeah. rules. Um, I don't think I've ever been to a game where they've lost. I thought you were at the Orange Bowl and they lost to USC. I was, but I wasn't heartbroken <laughs> about that. I, I had forgotten about that when I wrote that out of memory. <laughs> that game so, never happened anyway. I know, right? Thanks, Reggie Bush. <laughs> All right, so bend the rules and tell I, us your I top loss. I the rules. Rules. The rules. It was um, against BYU. Oh, in, yeah, 2009. In uh-huh. 2009, when Sam Bradford, 
after winning the Heisman, was supposed to do these great things again, and then suffers that injury, was never quite the same, at least at the University of Oklahoma. Yeah, what sucked about that was because Jermaine Gresham had gone out preseason with a knee injury, and then Bradford goes out the first game. But it ushered in the Landry Jones era. But was that worse than him like coming back and being healthy and then getting re-injured against Texas? Texas like, right. And then all the Texas fans cheered. Yeah. Classy, classy Texas fans. Uh, my top loss, I, I think I'm going to go back to that LSU game. Uh, in the Sugar Bowl because they had him. I mean, they had him on the ropes and uh, Chuck Long. Uh, I'm was just. It, it wasn't as bad as the USC because you have time to prepare for that. Yeah, like well, you, well, the you USC. You, you just. You know what's funny is is going into that game. I had said. Uh, I had said, Oklahoma. I'm sorry. I had said USC has never playing in the Pac-12. They've not faced a team with the speed that Oklahoma has on offense. And about halftime, a little bit before halftime, I looked and I said, hey, um, Oklahoma's never faced a team with this type of speed and power on offense. That, that was just a, a thorough. But the fun, the fun thing about that night is I got to meet um, Henry Winkler, uh, Mr. Coach Klein from the Waterboy, and I got to meet the Waynes brothers. So, I mean, hey, big night in Miami. So, um, anyway, all right, man, we're, this, this podcast is dragging on. So let, let's real fast go through our, our, our top five um, uh, for the Big 12 in 2018, and then we're going to do just the question mark. We don't need to give a lot of explanation here because uh, we're hitting the overtime button hardcore uh, right now. So uh, Texas is, is number five for me. My biggest question mark here is at the running back position. Uh, there's also questions about the left tackle position, but for me, it's it's running back. Like I said, this is the year where the Big 12 turns over from, uh, from a, a quarterback lead to a running back lead, and I'm not for sure who – who, who they have at that running back position. Kyle Porter, I believe, is going to be their, the guy, the number one. He's young, and then they've got a freshman behind him. There's not a lot of depth there. I'm, I am I am saying the offensive line, but I also have to question decision-making at this point in time. Um, I know that there were some comments that were thrown out about sprinkling magic fairy dust to get this team some wins. And so I, I am a little bit... Um, I, I shouldn't say cautious, but apprehensive of what kind of control there is, what kind of decisions will be made this season. But the biggest one on the field offensive line. Okay, know, number four for me, finishing in the Big 12 this year is Oklahoma State. Richard, I'll let you take off with the Cowboys. Yeah, I just put replacing offensive productivity. Um, we know we've talked about Justice Hill already, but they're losing quite a bit. They're losing – the big names that they've had mm -hmm. previously. And so who's going to step in? Who's going to fill those roles? And will they essentially lead this team with the same confidence that the class that has come before them did? I, I think for me with Oklahoma State, I, I'm in that position where I'm going to give Mike Gundy the benefit of the doubt that the guy knows what he's doing offensively. And I think they'll find a way with, with J.D. King, with, with – um, help me out here. I'm blanking. Why am I blanking on his name? Um, the other running back that I just said I really like, Justice no. Hill. Thank you. Um, I, I think they'll find a way to move the, to move the ball. What Mike Gundy has not been able to do really at Oklahoma State, except for 2011, is find a good defense. Now they've got a brand new defensive coordinator, but when you look back at the last three years, Oklahoma State has had a Big 12 championship caliber offense. It's just their defense has not been up to par. Um, and I, I don't know if that's a trend that continues into this year. If it is, it's, it's, it could be a very long year for Oklahoma State because they're going to have to rely on the defense a lot more than they have in the years past because they don't have um, they don't have James Washington, they don't have Marcel Aitman, they don't have Mason Rudolph. So for me, it um, when it comes to the Oklahoma State, I look at the defensive side of the ball. Same thing with uh, TCU. Uh, they're going to, you know, Gary Patterson is known as a defensive coach he's a defensive first guy what are they going to do on that side of the ball uh this year because they've got to get better than they were last year and again that's a big when you get to the top half of the league for me it, it becomes defense i mean that's going to be a theme when you're going to hear me say defense in fact i'm just going to go ahead and say it right now the the next two are defense as well but tcu starts the defense as well I'm taking the opposite side of the ball okay. from you with TCU and, and saying they've got that, receiver problems as well. I'm just saying it's the offensive scheme. I thought they did an adequate job, Sonny Cumbie, last year, and, and coming up with something that was workable. Um, was Kenny Hill the starter, and he's gone this year? Yeah, yeah he's okay. Gone. Well, didn't he get hurt? 
Mm-hmm. Okay. And I thought right. Sean Robinson, I think yeah, was his name. I, I thought they did an adequate job of designing something for him. It's when someone new takes over, what's that offensive scheme going to look like? How are they going to cater to him specifically? And how will he flourish in that offensive scheme? So offensive scheme is a big question mark for me. By the way, you mentioned Sonny Cumbie. He's going to be the next head coach at Texas Tech. Another bold prediction. All right, number two. Finish. Not Lincoln Riley. Not Lincoln Riley because he's locked up now. But that, that used to be my prediction. Um, number two for me in the Big 12 is West Virginia. That's your other team, Richard. Mm-hmm. What's your biggest question mark? It's the safety position. Um, if you looked at really quickly at their depth chart, you would see that the starter not only moved on, has graduated, but his backup also moved on, graduated. I, I think they're going to have to find someone pretty quickly to fill that role. Um, we know that they like to play a different uh, defensive scheme than what a typical defense will play. So finding that safety is going to be crucial for them. What if you knocked off his head, landed in my ear? I <laughs> that's don't, that button that's been okay. flying around the whole Sorry. time. Sorry. Um, okay, so I, look, here, here's the thing. It's on camera. Uh, Dana Holgerson, <laughs> Cliff Kingsbury, Mike Gundy, that, that coaching tree, that Texas Tech, Oklahoma State coaching tree, the, the, the two <laughs> things that they have in common with one another, high power offense, terrible defense. And as long as Dana Holgerson is the head coach at West Virginia, defense is always going to be my top question mark for them. There's just no other way around it. When's the last time Dana Holgerson coached anywhere that had a high caliber defense? I don't think you can find it, and that's going to be the issue again. That's, honestly, that's the only reason I'm picking West Virginia to, to be second to Oklahoma because of defense. I think they're going to be ahead of the Sooners offensively this year, but they're going to be behind Oklahoma significantly on the defensive side of the ball, which brings us to my number one, which is the Oklahoma Sooners, and I'm sticking with that theme of defense because I think this is a make-or-break year for Mike Stoops, and I think there there's talent there, uh, young talent. But the, quite, the the problem with young talent is that it's often underdeveloped talent, and becomes their first year in college football, they make those type of first year mistakes. And this is a year where I don't believe that Oklahoma can get away, or more specifically, Mike Stoops can get away with having guys making those first year mistakes. Defense, the future of Mike Stoops, because my number one question mark for Oklahoma. Yeah, I'll get a little more specific and, and say it's the secondary. Oklahoma is a team that gave up 27 points per game last year, alluding to something that you had mentioned earlier, Matt, in that Oklahoma had a high power offense that carried them through the season. And we showed that the talent on the offensive side of the ball can get you into the college football playoff, but it's the defensive side that's actually going to win it for you. And as much as I I, I may hate to give in to that notion, there it is. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, Oklahoma's secondary wasn't anything impressive. Um, What we saw with them was roughly 250 yards given up per game. We saw a rotation of, of young guys. So, a, to narrow it down even further is is how are they going to develop those players, the Parnell Motleys, the, right. the Trey Norwood, Norwoods. How much further are they going to come along with that extra year under their belt? Sooner Nation podcast, Heartland Sports, heartland-sports.com. He's Rich. I'm Matt. Thanks to Craig uh, from the Thunder Guys for hanging with us for a little bit. Uh, you can catch us on Twitter at Sports Heartland. Uh, we did not have more time to get into Oklahoma Super Regional, but at 4 o'clock Friday, uh, Rich and I will be at in Norman this weekend for the Super Regional uh, updates on Twitter and on the website, also Facebook. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for watching on Facebook. Uh, have a fantastic week. Boomer Sooner, everybody.